Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I'm going to talk quite a lot today about social science, economics, engineering and science. So I'm trying to pull all of that together in about 45 minutes in relation to climate change. So I have a very bad habit of often talking too fast. So if I'm talking too fast, please, please just, just call out and tell me to slow down. Or if you know everything that I'm saying, also tell me that as well. I can speed up then. Um, right, the ostrich um, or the phoenix, so these are hopefully um, metaphors, analogies, stories that you know about anyway. The ostrich, I, I always think, is it probably epitomises Western society, if not human beings in, in general, perhaps, um, that when things are difficult, our first response is to put our heads in the sand, to turn away, to pretend it's not happening. And we do that with, with many difficult issues um, that we face personally and, and more systemically in society. And the phoenix, um, I don't think it's quite so mythical. I think the phoenix lives within us, so I'm slightly more hopeful. But I think we're reluctant to let the phoenix out. Um, so I think the phoenix is something you know, that, that might emerge from the fossil fuel flames. Um, so I think the phoenix is, 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 the, is the sign of hope, if you like. And my subtitle to this, uh, I, I use two, two expressions here. First, cognitive dissonance, which is a, a fancy academic term um, that applies often to lots of us as fancy academics working on climate science, and it basically means hypocrisy. Um, so it's not something that is a, is a popular way of thinking about this, but cognitive dissonance is, in a sense, is hypocrisy. And the alternative to that, I think, that I think also that as a duality we have in all of us as well, is this version of thinking of the creativity that might emerge out of our, our problems around climate change. So um, I think like most things in life, there is, a, there is a duality. There's parts of that in this, and there are significantly parts of this as well. At the moment, unfortunately, this part is dominating. So, um, oh, and if, if you're interested, the, um, I have a Twitter account, and also a lot of what I write, uh, I also put on my website as well. So it's um, a lot of that, it's just free access things that I've put, I put together. I often get told that my talks are depressing. Um, so I'm going to start off with my conclusion, which I hope is a little bit more uplifting, <laughs> but not very. Um, avoiding dangerous climate change, and by that I'm going to use throughout this talk stabilisation at the 2 degrees C temperature rise level that's been agreed at international negotiations. But I would also like to put the very clear caveat on that, that at 2 degrees C centigrade rise, many poor people around the world will die. So let's be clear about that. Even the best that we are probably going to fail at achieving, trying to ach well, we're not even trying to achieve it at the moment, but if we did, many people will die who have not had anything to do with that problem. We know that when we sit here today with the lights on, the projectors running, using power, that we'll be killing people at 2 degrees C. So I'm calling that as the, th the appropriate threshold to aim for, but for many people around the world, it simply is not appropriate. But I think it's the best that we can probably hope, hope for now. I think it's just about feasible to hold to that level, but just. I also think um, that it fits with an economic framing, a positive outlook <coughs> economically, but only from the original Greek root of economics, which, um, apologising for my Greek pronunciation, comes from the word oikonemia, which means stewardship of the household, the prudent use of resources. The word money, wealth, and those types of expressions are not used in the original root of economics. And economics has been wrestled away by the financiers, the astrologists, the numerologists, into this crematistic version of it today, which is defined variously as the acquisition of wealth, the making of money. And I think, actually, we can do something about climate change with the normal, with the historical, proper root, meaningful root of economics, but not with this. And I was trying to think, how does that relate to Iceland? And maybe this has been a bit unfair, but fishing. I mean, you've been fishing here for many years, as far as I can tell, and you try to husband your stocks. You think about it in the long term. So it's not something about just making money. It's about your children, your children's children's life, and, and it's about how your society progresses. So you think of fishing in a particular way. And you have another industry that's quite well known worldwide, <laughs> um, banking. <laughs> Ephemeral industry carried out collectively by the detritus of society. But, of course, we all benefit from this. Not only are the people at the top benefiting from it enormously, from actually running things only in relation to the short term, but we have all benefited from that in some ways in relation to our pensions and so forth. And now that has been found wanting. It is not able to deliver even in its own system. So I just think that we have to remind ourselves, we have to wrestle economics back away from the financiers, back to the original root of where it came from the prudent use of resources, which I think fits very well with actually avoiding dangerous climate change. Um, 
probably the only other foreign word, because I'm not particularly good at languages. Um, Friday in Stockholm, 2000 and end of September 2013, the IPCC science report came out. It offered no solace and no surprises. It was the, the usual sort of science that we've we had for a long time from the IPCC. The scientific message for policymakers, business leaders, civil society, for all of us, hasn't changed in a quarter of a century. The first report came out in 1990, and nothing significant from a doing something about reducing our emissions side of things has come out of the new reports. We knew everything we needed to know in 1990 about, about reducing our emissions. There's lots about uh, adaptation and impacts that comes later, but we knew everything we needed to know about reducing emissions in 1990. What came out in the report are small adjustments and refinements, because despite what the sceptics might try and tell us, this is a mature science. It relies on tried and tested physics that's worked for, for decades, if not, if not uh, centuries. So nothing particularly surprising out of the report. But what has changed since the last IPCC report in 2007? Well, we've successfully dumped another 200 billion tonnes of CO2 in the atmosphere. So quite knowingly, we've merrily chucked up 200 gigatons, 200 billion tonnes of CO2, since the last report in 2007. Our emissions today are 60% over that, maybe nearer 65% higher in carbon dioxide than they were in the time uh, in when we first showed a concern in 1990 at the time of the first report. 60% higher. So we claimed to be concerned about it then, and now we're 60% higher in terms of emissions. And as probably you're all aware, that CO2 concentrations now in the atmosphere are higher than they have been for 800,000 years, which I think is, a, is heading towards three times longer than humans have been on the planet. So the sort of litany of our failures um, are, are quite disturbing, I think. Despite that, we repeatedly sign up to making our fair contribution, this is taken from the Copenhagen Accord, to hold the increase in global temperature. Notice that below 2 degrees C, it doesn't say a 30% chance of, or a 60% chance, or a 50-50 chance. It says below, which means a high probability of not, not going above 2 degrees, and take action to meet this objective, consistent with science. That's fairly radical for policymakers, and even more radical for policymakers on the basis of equity. Now, we have signed up to this repeatedly at virtually every international negotiation where lots of carbon is emitted as we fly to them, um, whether it's in Copenhagen, Cancun, Doha, Durban, all of these events. So we continually sign up to this. So we should hold our paymasters, indeed we should hold ourselves to account to what, as democracies, we have signed up to. So two degrees C, which I say is going to be the focus of this talk, my hypothesis is that the only way that we can avoid dangerous climate change, dangerous climate change that is already going to kill many people anyway, and we have to accept that, and we should not forget that, is that we need deep and immediate reductions in energy demand. Now, I'm saying this as an engineer who spent a lot of time working on oil platforms, producing oil um, and other bits of engineering kit, that I don't think we can solve this problem with engineering. Engineering is a prerequisite for solving it. It is really important, but it is not enough. We need deep and immediate reductions in energy demand, and that is very unpopular, because that means people like us. And the argument that normally we get is, well, surely we can do it with technology, with low carbon energy supply, with wind, solar, geothermal, nuclear, all these things that are very low carbon. Surely we can do it with those. But the problem is, climate change is a cumulative problem. We have carbon budgets. It's not about uh, the sorts of targets that certainly in the UK were a major focus, and uh, quite a lot of international negotiations, about what we are going to do by 2050. 2050 is an irrelevant date in terms of climate change. Any scientist who has ever referred to doing something by 2050 should put money into a scientific research box for other people to do proper research from. 2050 has nothing to do with climate change. The only thing that matters in terms of the temperatures are the cumulative emissions that occur over the century, the carbon budgets. And the reason we like this is it means we can rely on the technologists to solve the problem in 2030, 2040, and 2050. The reason we don't like this, even though it's got more science behind it, it means we have to do something about it today and yesterday, preferably. So the science fundamentally changes the politics and the philosophy, the culture of climate change. So let's think about this graphically. Here we have a graph. Um, with carbon dioxide up the side here, from fossil fuels primarily, but also from cement, and the data at the bottom from 1980 um, out to 2050. And these are, this is the emissions here, 20 billion tonnes, 20 gigatons, back in uh, 1980. The United Nations um, Panel on Climate Change, uh, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was set up in 1988. The emissions were going up here. This is when we first started to express, at an international level, our concern for climate change, if you could see it like that. Um, 
things are looking quite positive now. We have the Rio Earth Summit that some of you may remember. Anyone with grey hair or no hair might remember the, uh, the Rio Earth summit, summit. Um, very positive, upbeat, I think appropriately upbeat, thinking what could come out of that. Agenda 21 came out of it, which was a really interesting sort of social dimension to it as well, but a lot of concern about climate change, biodiversity and so forth. And emissions there were sort of stabilising out. We had the Kyoto Protocol um, adopted in 97, I think it was, um, and it came into force for those countries that were signatories to it in 2005. Um, just look at what's happened to the emissions during our period of concern. Um, you can plot this as period of concern for how often scientists spend on a plane. Um, they both have the same trajectory. Um, Copenhagen Accord, 2009-2010. Look at the, where the emissions are today. Rio plus 20. Many of you probably will have heard of that one. Or probably all of you have heard of the Rio plus 20. People thought of it as Rio plus 20 years. I think of it as Rio plus 20 billion tonnes. Because our emissions... Uh, this, this is after our period of concern here. Our emissions are almost 20 billion tonnes higher than we first pretended to be concerned about it back in 1990. They're not quite 20 billion tonnes, but they're approximately there. So that's, our, that's a plot of our, of our... Well, it's an inverse plot of our concern about climate change, really. And then we've now got an economic downturn. At least we've had an economic downturn um, and a recession in some parts of the world, but certainly a slowdown in the global economy. And yet emissions have continued to rise, and quite disturbingly, they went up very high in 2010, possibly as a kickback to the, to the difficult times economically or financially um, in 2008, 2009 and, um, and then on into 10. And then since then they've been growing about 2 to 3% per annum. So these are very high growth rates. These growth rates are almost three times higher than the 1% growth rate that we saw during the 1990s. And they are from a larger number. So during our time of concern, not only have the emissions gone up, but the rate of growth has almost tripled which is really concerning. You think of this, you know, it's an exponential problem then. So what are future emissions? That's where we are at the moment. What do we think about future emissions? Well, let's think about the energy system. My focus is mostly on energy. That's what much of this talk is going to be about. I have colleagues that work on the food side of things as well, but I'm going to focus on energy. Um, we're locked into the technologies we build. If we build a power station, whether it's a coal, a nuclear, or a geothermal power station, whether it's wind, gas, solar, all of these power stations, the first ones, coal, nuclear, so forth, these will probably last for 50 years. These gas, wind and solar, probably 30 years, and tidal, possibly as much as 100 years. So when we build them, we lock in an infrastructure for decades. When we have large-scale infrastructures themselves, whether it's electric networks, sewage pipe works, um, road networks, rail networks, when we put those into place, that again locks us in for decades, if not hundreds of years. If in the UK, we're using a sewage network and a gas network that have been there for decades and electrical cables often that have been there for a long time as well. And if you have the built environment, think of houses and flats. I live in a house that was built in 1860. They're very popular where I live. Many of the houses were built in 1860, and they will be there in 2050 as well. Factories and so forth, commercial buildings. These lock us in. Everything we do today locks us in. Aircraft and ships. I came on a ship here that was 23 years old. And a Boeing 747 was first designed in 1964, the big Boeing 47 aircraft. Uh, designed in 64, first sold in 69, and unless you're an airplane buff or geek, you would not spot the difference between a current Boeing 747 and one that was sold, sold in 1969. They look basically the same. There's some difference in the, in, in, in the engines. They are more efficient than they were then, but I, I, in a sense, they're the same plane as they were then. Think of the Airbus A380, the new super jumbo. If that follows the same path, that will be in the air in 2080. It makes you think that when we do these things, when we build anything today, we are locking the future into very long periods of, of use of those technologies. So it is not about solving the problem tomorrow. Everything we do today is defining what tomorrow looks like. So 30 to 100 years at least for all of these things that we do. So we lock things in very quickly. Now, if we think about extrapolating out current emissions at the, at the current rate at 3% per annum, there or thereabouts, and then dropping it off, imagine that there is actually gradually some shift towards a low-carbon future. Then you're going to get a scenario that looks something like that. And for those that are familiar with the RCPs or the old SRES scenarios, that's roughly the same as um, A1FI or RCP 8.5. So this is the high end of emissions that are envisaged by the IPCC. The high end. That's quite a concern because that's just business as usual. Surely the high end should be above business as usual as other parts of the world start to join in with the economic growth that we've enjoyed in the West. So I, I'm quite concerned that our scenarios do not really cover a full family of where we could be going on climate change. There's a question then to ask, is that level of growth realistic? And I'm going to use here an example of the UK, because that's where I come from, and also the UK 
in its usual colonial, arrogant fashion, has, 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 likes to see itself as a leading nation on climate change. So what's the, what's the, what is a, um, a leading nation on climate change doing? And it's doing a lot of good things. I, I'm hastening around it. It's doing a lot of good things, but they're rhetorical at the moment. They're not actually about action. What we're doing on action, we've just given tax breaks to shale gas. Shale gas is natural gas. It's 75% methane. When you burn it, you get a lot of carbon dioxide. The plan is to build 30 new gas-fired power stations. We've had the highest investment ever in North Soil in 2012 and 13, I think it was. We've reopened a few small Scottish coal mines. We're expanding aviation and ports. We've had emission standards from the EU significantly wat their water down the standards for cars. We're supporting Arctic exploration because we want to use our expertise in the oil industry to help the Norwegians and possibly um, the Icelanders uh, get out the, the hydrocarbons from underneath the Arctic. And we've opened a consulate in Alberta next to the tar sands so we can sell our expertise to the world's most dirty, polluting form of energy that we can so far produce. Now, this is one of the leading nations on climate change. So I would suggest that the curve that looks like that is probably fairly optimistic. Um, so that, that's what we're doing at the moment on climate change. Let's not be... And let's not pretend otherwise that we have done nothing about climate change since 1990 other than watch the emissions rise. So globally we're set to some very large amount of carbon dioxide, a, a, a budget of something like, and it could be up or down a bit from this, so the usual caveats apply here with some uncertainties around this, but that's the sort of um, number of uh, tonnes of CO2. 5,000 billion tonnes of CO2 to be emitted sometime during this century. Now if you apply... Uh, um, Think of that in terms of what, that's what comes out of the IPCC latest reports in terms of carbon dioxide uh, budgets and temperature. Then we link that to four to six degrees C temperature rise. So we're looking towards very large temperature rises by the end of the century. Now, whether it's three and a half or whether it's five or six, we, we're not sure. And that, that uncertainty will remain. But it's a very high temperature increase by the end of the century. That is where we're heading at the moment. Um, and yet, for a likely chance of what we sign up to, what we keep telling the poor people of the world we're going to make sure we deliver for them, when we're being dishonest to them, um, we could only emit 1,000 gigatons. That's the most. In fact, that 1,000 gigatons taken from the IPCC report goes from 2011. We're in 2015. We've already used up about 15% of that budget since 2011. 15%. So we're already much lower than that. So recent support, uh, recent um, history supports the view from the IEA, the International Energy Authority uh, Agency, um, that the CO2 trend is perfectly in line with a temperature increase of 6 degrees Celsius, which would have devastating consequences for the planet. Whether it's 4, 5 or 6, who knows exactly, but very large temperature increases, but certainly devastating consequences for the planet. Now, the IEA, who are not a, not a left-wing think tank, they are normally quite conservative in their views on these things, are speaking out very significantly on climate change. It's really worth reading some of the things that they're saying on climate change now. Um, so what about 2 degrees C? That's the four to six pathway. That's the thousand gigaton pathway for two degrees C. Look at the gap between those two, just an enormous. That's where we're, we're knowingly heading. We're all part of this, and that's where we know we have to go from the science, and that's where we keep telling other parts of the world we're going to try to achieve. The problem with that, and as an engineer, this is quite depressing in some respects, is that this part at the beginning, where we are now, is too early for low carbon supply. You cannot build your way out of this with bits of engineering kit. And that is quite depressing, because that leaves us with the social implications of what do we have to do otherwise. But I want to just want to test that assumption. Just think about this. There's been a lot of discussion, I don't know about within Iceland, but in the UK, quite a lot of environmentalists have swapped over saying they think nuclear power is, is the answer, or at least one of the major answers to this. And I'm not, I'm, I remain agnostic about nuclear power. You know, it's very low carbon, 5 to 15 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour, so it's, it's similar to renewables and five to ten times lower than carbon capture and storage. So nuclear power is very low carbon. It has lots of other issues, but it's very low carbon. But let's put a bit of perspective on this. We, we, totally, we consume in total about 100,000 terawatt hours of energy around the globe. So just a very large amount of energy. Lots of energy, for those of you who are not familiar with these units. <laughs> um, global electricity consumption is about 20,000 terawatt, hour, terawatt hours. So 20% of lots of energy. So that's our electricity. Nuclear provides about 11.5% of the electricity around the globe of what we consume, of, of our final energy consumption. So that means nuclear provides about 2.5% of the global energy demand. About 2.5%. That's from 435 nuclear power stations. 
to provide 2.5% of the world's energy demand. If you wanted to provide 25% of the world's energy demand, you'd probably need something in the region of three or 4,000 new nuclear power stations to be built in the next 30 years. Three or 4,000 new nuclear power stations to make a decent dent in our energy consumption. And that assumes our energy consumption remains static, and it's not, it's going up. We're building 70. So just to put some sense on this, you hear this with every technology, whether it's wind, wave, tidal, CCS, all these big bits of technology, these are going to solve the problem. You cannot build them fast enough to get us away from the fact that we're going to blow our carbon budget. And that's a really uncomfortable message, because no one wants to hear that, because the repercussions of that are that we have to reduce our energy demand. So we have to reduce demand now. Now, it is really important, the supply side, I'm not saying it's not important, it is essential, but if we do not do something about demand, we will not be able to hold to two, probably even three degrees C. Now, that's a global analysis, and the, the argument would be, well, we have signed up repeatedly on the basis of equity. And when we say that, we normally mean the poorer parts of the world will be, allowed to, will be able to peak their emissions later than we will be able to in the West. And that seems a quite a fair thing that probably that no one would really argue, I think, against the idea of poorer parts of the world having a bit more time and space before they move off fossil fuels, because that, that links to their welfare, to their improvements, that use of energy. Now, let's imagine that the poor parts of the world, the non-OECD countries, um, I usually use the language of non-Annex 1 countries for those people who are familiar with that sort of IPCC language. Um, let's imagine that those parts of the world, including India and China, could peak their emissions by 2025. That is hugely challenging. I think it's just about doable, particularly if we, led, if we sh showed some examples in the West. But I think it's just about possible as the emissions are going up significantly, they could peak by 2025 before coming down. And if we then started to get a reduction by, say, 2028, 2029, 2030, of 6 to 8% per annum, which, again, is a massive reduction rate, that, that is a big challenge for poor parts of the world. So I'm not letting them get away with anything here. That's saying if they did all of that, you can work out what carbon budget they would use up over the century. And then you know what the total carbon budget is for 2 degrees centigrade, and you can say what's left for us, the wealthy parts of the world. That seems quite a fair way of looking at this. And if you do it like that, what's that mean for us? That means we'd have to have, and I'm redoing this now, and I think it's going to be well above 10%, because this is based on, on a paper in 2011, which was using data from 2009 to 10. So I think this number is probably going to be nearer the, the 13 to 15% mark now. But about a 10% per annum reduction rate in emissions year on year, starting preferably yesterday. That's a 40% reduction in our total emissions by 2018. Just think of our own lives. Could we reduce our emissions by 40% by 2018? I'm sure we could. I'm sure we'll choose not to, but I'm sure we could do that. But a 70% reduction by 2024, 2025? And basically, we'd have to be pretty much zero carbon emissions, not just from electricity, from everything by 2030 or 2035, that sort of time frame. That just, that's, that's just the simple, blunt maths that comes out of the carbon budgets and very demanding reduction rates from poor parts of the world. That, these are radical emission reduction rates that we cannot, you say you cannot build your way out of. You have to do it with, with how we consume our energy in the short, short term. Now, if that looks too difficult, well, what about 4 degrees C? Because that's what you hear all the time, that's too difficult. So what about 4 degrees C? Because actually, the 2 degrees C we're heading towards is probably nearer 3 now anyway. So, um, depending on your probabilities. So let's think about four degrees C. Well, what it gives you is a larger carbon budget. And we all like that, because it means I can attend more fancy international conferences. And we can carry on going on rock climbing holidays, in my case. You know, we can all carry on doing and living the lives that we like. So we quite like a larger carbon budget. Lower rates of mitigation. But what are the impacts? This is not my area, so I'm taking some work here from the Hadley Centre in the UK, who did some, some analysis with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. But you're all probably familiar with these sorts of things. And there's a range of these impacts that are out there. A 4 degrees C global average means you're going to have much larger um, averages on land because most of, the most of the planet is covered in oceans and they take longer to warm up. But think uh, during the heat waves what that might play out to mean. So during times when we're already under stress in our societies. Think of the European heat wave. I don't know whether it got to Iceland or not. Um, in 2003, well, it was, it was quite warm in the rest of Europe. <laughs> um, too warm. It's probably much nicer in Iceland. Um, there were 20 to 30,000 people died across Europe during that period. Now, add eight degrees on top of that heat wave, and it could be a longer heat wave. And you start to think that our infrastructures start to break down. The cables that we use to bring power to our homes, to our fridges, to our water pumps, those cables are underground, and they're cooled by soil moisture. 
As the soil moisture evaporates during a prolonged heat wave, those cables cannot carry as much power to our fridges and our water pumps. So our fridges and water pumps can no longer work. Some of them will be now starting to break down. So the food in our fridges will be perishing. At the same time, that our neighbour's food is perishing. So you live in London, 8 million people, three days of food in the whole city, and it's got a heat wave and the food is anyway perishing in the fridges. So you think you're going to bring the food from the ports. But the similar problems might be happening in Europe. And anyway, the tarmac for the roads that we have in the UK can't deal with those temperatures, so it's melting. So you can't bring the food up from the ports. And the, and the uh, train lines that we put in place aren't designed for those temperatures, and they're buckling, so you can't bring the trains up. So you've got 8 million people in London, in, a, in an advanced nation, that is starting to struggle with these sorts of um, temperature changes. So even in industrialised countries, you can imagine this playing out quite negatively, a whole sequence of events not looking particularly positive. In China, look at the buildings they're putting up there, in some of the Shanghai and, and uh, Beijing and so forth. They've got no thermal mass. These buildings are not going to be good with high temperatures, and yet we still see big increases there. And in, in some parts of the States, it could be as high as 10 or 12 degrees temperature rises. These are all a product of a 4 degrees C average temperature. At the same time, big increases in sea level. Many of you here know much more about that than me, but I think people think not uncommonly about a metre by the end of the century if you're heading towards these sorts of emission rates, and it would keep going up beyond that. And that has big implications. We've seen 20 centimetres, I think, so far from thermal expansion, um, um, but obviously that would keep going up. But I think also very significantly, food crops. This is work, again, from the Hadley Centre, a 40% reduction in the staple crops in some of the lower latitudes. Um, and that's not just due to, in fact, most of that, I, ba I believe, is not due to changes in precipitation, but is due, into, due actually to the temperatures themselves. So at 2 degrees C, precipitation is a big issue. I think at 4 degrees C, the temperatures start to play a big issue. And at the same time, of course, the population is going up, and we're needing to, earn, uh, needing to eat more food. I think it's fair to say, and I'd be no interested if any of you disagree with this here, there's a widespread view that 4 degrees C is incompatible with um, an organised, I'd like to say civilised, but I'm not sure we ever quite got there, um, an organised global community. I think we would probably end up, as we normally do, particularly men, we will reach for the Kalashnikov and we'll end up fighting each other for scarce access to resources. And there's plenty of good examples of that's how we respond to difficult situations. I think it's beyond adaptation, four degrees C. OK, uh, you might be fine if you live in Iceland. My family come from the west coast of Scotland on an island, so I'll be going to visit them. But there's so lots of other people trying to get to these parts of the world. So maybe a few of us can adapt. But for many people, we will not be able to adapt to this level of changes. It will be devastating to ecosystems, ecosystems that we survive and rely on, but also ecosystems that I think have not just an instrumental right to be there, but there's something more immutable about them. They're part of our planet, and it is not our role to destroy them in the rates that we're doing now. And Certainly as we head towards 4 degrees C, there may well be other tipping points, non-linearities out there that mean that the temperature rise could keep going up to a much higher equilibrium level. Um, so you'll have heard about those. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty around them. All we know for certain is that the higher the temperature goes, the greater the chance that these tipping points could be important. And I don't know anyone really that doesn't agree um, with th that, that 4 degrees C temperature rise as a global average should be avoided at, at all costs. And I quite like that because for economists who, you, who, who really are obsessed by discount rates, certain, certainly uh, neoclassical economists, all doesn't mean that it doesn't matter what discount rate the economist applies, you have to do something about it. So you cannot make an argument that it's too, too expensive. We have to avoid this at all costs because we cannot survive there in any significant numbers and also I think it is detrimental to much of the planet. So let's return to 2 degrees C. So I think we have to make, there's a very strong case that we have to do everything we can to avoid t 4 and probably aim for trying to keep as near to 2 as we reasonably can. Is it still a viable goal? Most people will say no. And I give a lot of talks and I ask that at the beginning um, often. And people say, I don't think we can hold to 2 degrees C. I think we can, but I think we will choose not to. And, uh, and when I say we, I mean we will choose not to. People like us, the elites of the world that are well-educated, well-resourced, all information at our fingertips, that have the choice of doing something but have chosen to do nothing. All of us, collectively, our family, our friends, our communities, the whole circles within which we live, we are the ones that are doing this. So I think we can just hold to it. And there are three things, three parts of this, which I'm going to just touch on. One is on equity. There's only, only, only a relatively small group of the population are responsible for the lion's share of the emissions. And that is changing over time. Technology, I think there's a lot we can do with technology, but much of that is on the demand side, the less sexy end of technology, about toasters, about cars, about the th small things that we actually quite often replace, refrigerators, washing machines, that sort of thing. And also I think we have to revisit this concept of growth. Um, I mean, anyone I think that's got a science background has always found that slightly hard to understand how 
some social scientists, scientists in particular disciplines that which remain nameless, seem to think you can have infinite growth on a round planet but, um, just through substitution. So applying Pareto, if anyone come across Vilfredo Pareto, an old uh, political economist from um, Italy, and many of you would have used his rule of thumb anyway. I used this for years as an engineer before I knew it came from an Italian economist. 80% and 80-20 rule. And 80% of something relates to 20% of those involved. Now, it's just a rough guideline. It doesn't always hold. But it doesn't seem too unreasonable for wealth and emissions. And some of the work that's recently come out from Oxfam seems to be along these sorts of lines. It's just as a guideline. 80% of emissions come from 20% of the population. That doesn't seem too unreasonable. And when we've done sort of tests on it, that seems to broadly hold. And I bet if you did the sample of this group here, which would all be in the high emission section, I would, well, very, almost all of us probably, I bet there's a huge difference in the emissions within this group here. And that most of the emissions come from a relatively small proportion of the group in, in, this, in this room. But then if you go to inside that 20% and say, does that hold again? Could you run that in that 20%? If you do that three times, what you get is a number that actually, I mean, I, I've been using this slide for years, so it's not just followed the Oxfam slide, but the Oxfam slide recently showed that 1% that of the world's population owns 50% of the wealth. And wealth broadly ties with emissions, but not that closely. So this is just a very, very approximate guide to suggest that a lot of the emissions come of a, from a very small percentage of the population. I think more helpfully is you should, we should be using a range that something like 40, 40 to 60% of the emissions come from 1% to 5% of the population. Now, we're trying to get some data to sort of underpin this. It's really hard to collect the data on this. And also, methodologically, it's quite hard. How do you deal with savings? How do you deal with the fact that a lot of people in our sorts of positions, in nice positions in ac as academics, when we fly somewhere, we might spend a few days holiday there as well. So how do you separate out holiday and work activities? So they're quite difficult to do that. But it seems to give us a guide here. And I think that's quite helpful. Because that means you can tailor the policies to the people that emit but who are they? Do we, if you know who they are, we can think, well, what do they do? What do we need to do to reduce their emissions? Well, let's have the first group in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> climate scientists. Now, I, it is slightly amusing, but actually, when we really think about it, climate scientists, we are the ones that know everything that there is to know, really, pretty much, about climate science. We cannot claim an information, information deficit. We cannot claim to not know about these issues. We not, cannot know, cannot claim that we don't know that the emissions we're putting out now within the set carbon budget mean other people will die. That's what we're talking about. This is, this is not some existential problem that we should just is out there to be thought about. This is a problem of today, of what we're doing now, and of poorer communities elsewhere in the world at the moment, and later on, our own children. So I think we have to think about who's in this group and how we should be responding. Every OECD academic is not just climate scientists. If you're an academic, you're pretty much in this group, by and large. If you take a long-haul flight, I've just adjusted that recently because people said maybe the short-haul flights don't quite hold, but generally if you take short-haul flights, you also take long-haul flights. You also use taxis. You probably live in a slightly larger house. You know, generally, people that fly are the wealthier in the world. Most people in the world do not fly. The only planes they see are going overhead. Um, so anyone who takes an annual long-haul flight or two, 2 degrees C is a, is a mitigation, is a short-term challenge. And the big red herring that we use is, it, is about population. Actually, it's not. It's about what we do between now and 2025, 2030 in terms of reducing our energy consumption and thereby our emissions at the same time as building low carbon supply. It is a consumption problem, not a population problem. This is a complete red herring that population is the problem. And you just do the basic maths on that. Take the, the median person in China. Assume you've got this thing called trickle-down economics, which has never occurred in the history of humankind, but let's imagine it did occur. Take that median person. Imagine you have 7% per annum growth in China and see how long it is before the Chinese, the median person, larger numbers of them, start to own cars and refrigerators. It won't be before 2025, 20, 2030, by which time we will have to have made a major switch to low carbon energy supply. And then it doesn't matter from a carbon perspective, maybe from a sustainability, but not from a carbon perspective, if they have cars and refrigerators, because they'll have to be low carbon by then. So if we're serious about 2 degrees C, it is a consumption problem, not a population problem. That's not to say that it doesn't affect China. There's 300 million people in China who live like we do in, in the UK or in Iceland, but there's a billion people who do not. Um, so where does that, that leave us? I'm just, gonna use just the example of flying. What does that mean to us about how we have to think about these challenges and problems? The science is really clear. We have a carbon budget for a given temperature. We have decided, not by scientists, the civil, civil society, the political negotiations, the messy process of international negotiations has come up with this two degrees C as being the appropriate threshold between acceptable and dangerous, with all the caveats that go along with that. We have a carbon budget that comes with it. And therefore, 
We know when we fly somewhere, or when we ta take a taxi or somewhere, or when we buy a bigger house and heat more of that house, which is less of an issue in Iceland because you have ge geothermal heating, I'm aware of that. But generally when we do these things, when, we, when I fly to a rock climbing event um, with my friends, we can either do that um, or we can have access to energy for the poor people around the world. And access to energy for the poor people around the world gives them um, better improved welfare. But in the short term, their access to energy will primarily be fossil fuel. There'll be some renewables, but primarily it's going to be fossil fuel. So every tonne we use doing an activity here means that we think the poor people should remain poor for longer if we're going to stay in the 2 degree C carbon budget. And if we think we're not going to stay in the 2 degree C carbon budget, every time we fly we think that these people should suffer more from the impacts of climate change. That is the conscious decision that we are putting in our heads in the sand about as an ostrich. We have to make that decision when we choose to admit over and above what we think is a reasonable level for a typical human being. And we are doing that all the time, but we, of course, we act as the ostrich, not as the phoenix. We can't have both. And that's quite a depressing message, but I think quite uplifting in some respects, because it gives us a framework within which to think about these things. But technology can do a lot, and which I'm quite pleased about as an engineer. I'm going to talk, uh, touch on just two things. Cars. Now, OK, we should be driving, we should be going by public transport, we should be travelling yeah, less, perhaps, as well. So lots of other things we should be doing, but I'm just going to look at something really simple in terms of cars and refrigerators, two very exciting subjects. They are to me, but perhaps not to other people. <laughs> um, I'm also quite interested in cement, another very interesting subject. <laughs> um, so private road transport. The EU, in the EU and the US, it represents, this is from private cars, about 12 to 15% of emissions, so a significant chunk of emissions. It's often said that it's intractable. There's nothing we can do really significantly quick about cars. That's why we should look at power stations, because they're easier. And I think this is just fundamentally wrong. There are, th and th this would have changed more recently now, but there are 270 petrol and diesel cars that emit below 100 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometre that they travel. The average in the UK is 168 grams. The average in the States is 212 grams. The new, very weak rules that have been watered down thanks to BMW Mercedes, Volkswagen, and spineless MEPs um, is, is going to be 100, is 130 grams. But we have already petrol and diesel, not electric, not hybrid, 270 models. These include every single category except for the very large sports SUV category. But every other category is now in that, that group there. So we can do that with, with, with existing car infrastructure. It's also worth bearing in mind, and I don't know what it is for Iceland, this holds for, I think, all of the UK and pretty much most of continental Europe that 60% or so of the vehicle kilometres travelled by cars are travelled by cars that are under eight years old. So the natural replacement cycle for most of those kilometres is quite quick. And that's the same for a lot of end-use appliances. Unlike power stations, which last for 25, 30, 50 years, most of the other things that we buy, laptops, little devices like this, the, things that the, ma the material things that we buy that use energy last between one and five, eight, maybe ten years at the outside. Just think of applying some standards to this, to this intractable sector. If you use the standards, if you said 100 grams was the maximum you could have, and we're going to tighten that up every single year, so give a market signal to the industry, um, there would be no additional capital cost. These cars are actually slightly cheaper to buy than the average ones that we're buying. So no additional capital cost, no new infrastructure, a reduced operating cost. We have to consume a lot less energy because we don't have to buy as much fuel because the cars are more efficient. They have identical infrastructure, the same petrol stations and diesel stations, so there's nothing different about what you have to do. You can have less of them, because you don't have to stop as often, because they're more efficient. No employment changes, because the same factors that make the inefficient cars that we so love, particularly men, are the same, cars that, the same factors that make the efficient cars as well. They're made next door to each other. And effectively, they almost look the same a lot of the time now. And they're the same companies that are doing it. This is an intractable sector, so we're told. Yet this is so straightforward that any politician who was, had a spine and thought that this was a serious issue, could actually drive this sort of thing through. Look at the reductions. You would have a reduction of about, in 10 years, of about 50 to 70 percent, depending where you applied it, the US th or, or the U or UK or Europe, because the US cars have much more scope for improvements in efficiency. But a very large reduction in emissions in 10 years with no change in technology, no change in infrastructure, doing just the same that we do today. And yet we have chosen not even to do that. So that's, a that's, an, and that's an intractable sector. I think that's a really easy sector. And we should be driving less as well. 
The other thing to think about this is the, the, we have a uh, labelling system for a lot of appliances. Refrigerators is a good example. They use about 17% of electricity in the UK homes is used by refrigerators. Um, and an A++ refrigerator uses 80% less energy than an A-rated refrigerator for the same size. So why are we selling this rubbish? Because we believe in freedom of choice. We don't believe that governments should put in rules. Do you s why not just have a standard that says you cannot have any, any refriger refrigerator that's sold has to be at this level? And just tell the manufacturer that it's going to be tightened up at 10% every single year. Now, they'll squeal at first, but then they'll just do it. And then if you ask them 10 years later, would you like us to take the standard away? They'll say no, because that actually provides a level playing field for them to think about their technology and their investment. So we should be doing this with refrigerators. Th and th these refrigerators cost no more than these. Th the difference in price is primarily related to, is it a retro refrigerator? Does it look a bit old-fashioned, make it look trendy? Does it have a, a juice chiller or an ice cube maker or some other essential gadget in our fridges? Um, so th big appliance op opportunities there. And if you, s if you had a phase out there, just as a standard that phased these out, said all new refrigerators have to be at the high standard, then you'd save about 60% in 10 years. So these two sectors that are supposed to be quite tricky, just, just two I've chosen here, can be achieved at no change to what we normally do in our lives. Now, there are lots of things that we need to change in our lives as well. This is not enough. But I'm just going to show here, technology can make massive adjustments, but we have chosen not to use them. Now, the last one is growth which I think is a, is a real problem for us. Um, but actually, where opportunities exist at the moment. It's a, there's a, a sort of a mis, misguided proxy, I think, for welfare growth. Um, many climate economists, um, I won't go into naming them now because we have a lot in the UK that talk about this, but it's very common. And if you look at the integrated assessment models that inform a lot of governments, there's effectively an embedded assumption here that any reduction rate, mitigation, reduction in carbon dioxide, of over 4% per annum, is incompatible with economic growth. Have, have any of you heard of the Stern report? Well, S Nicholas Stern holds broadly to that view, and so does the Committee on Climate Change. And that's why the reduction rate, so when emissions go up and then whenever they come down, for almost every single scenario is never more than four, may occasionally touch on 5%, because they've been guided by astrologers, sorry, not astrologists, or new models, <laughs> economists, the same thing. The, the first two are cheaper to employ and just as reliable, um, <laughs> at least for these sorts of problems. So we, we've been told by that. But what I find interesting here is the economist's economy is stalled. These people are dragged out on television and tele radio programmes, I'm assuming in Iceland, like in the UK, to explain the economic collapse that they presided over. Now, why on earth are we listening to what they have to say? <laughs> Alan Greenspan, the head of the Central Reserve, probably one of the most eminent economists in the world, found, sa said to a Congress hearing that he'd found a fundamental flaw in his model. Markets do not self-regulate. <laughs> Now, I think anyone who's got a pet dog, their pet dog will know that markets don't self-regulate. <laughs> Yet one of the most eminent economists found that as a fundamental flaw. He was shocked by this fundamental flaw as well, apparently. <laughs> so why are we asking these economists again? Why would you ask the foxes how to guard the chicken coop? That's what we're doing here. Oh, and the last one seems to have disappeared. Um, <laughs> so there was supposed to be one there, but it's gone. But anyway, let's ignore that one. I think it was a very, very UK-focused one. But what I'm trying to say here is that we think about this in relation to growth and so forth and what the economists have been telling us. And obviously, economists do some very good things, but the scale of the challenge we're looking at here is beyond the ability of their tools to address. We have an unprecedented opportunity to think differently. The way that we've been forced to think for the last 20 years by the increasing penetration of this group into every facet of life into, into the police force, the, the, into how you monitor how good they're doing, how well they're doing, into how you, well universities are doing, into all of the facets of life. Everything now is converted into money to make an assessment of it. We can, it's failed, and we should be thinking fundamentally differently about this problem. And that, I think, is quite hopeful. We have the opportunity. They happen to come together at the same time. The climate calamity in terms of doing something about it and the economic collapse. But at the moment, we're choosing not to. We're choosing to go back to the same charlatans to try and ask how we should solve this problem. Growth also subsumes a whole host of social goods. It assumes welfare, health, life expectancy, employment, income, equity, security, literacy rates, you know, how good we feel about crime and so forth in our society. These are the things that matter to most of us in our lives, things that can't be valued. I doubt many of you here who have children have a particular value for one child compared to another child or compared to your partner. You don't put a pound sign on those. An environmental economist would do. But, but none of us do that. In fact, the most important things in our lives do not have a numerical value. 
and could not be numerically valued. The problem with growth is you have to convert everything into money. It takes the heterogeneous world, the rich world within which we live, that is made up of many things, and converts it into a homogeneous euro, pound, or kroner. And that is a real mistake, and we need to be escaping that as being the premise for how successful our society is doing. So we need to break away from that version of looking at growth. Growth itself has no meaningful value. So I'll come back to the last two slides, I think, now. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, we need a radical plan for two degrees C. I would suggest we need two phases. The first phase is particularly among unpopular amongst people like us because we are the high emitters by and large. And that means we have to reduce our energy demand. And we just need to be doing it now. We should have started doing it before. And that is difficult. That is not easy for us. That means some very significant changes to how we are living our lives. I think our lives can be richer in some respects, but also in other respects they're going to be poorer. But it's difficult. But we have to bear in mind that every time we emit an extra tonne above what we think is reasonable for us, someone else has to pay that cost, and it'll only ever be a poor person. But at the same time, we need a Marshall-style plan, for those that are old enough to remember the Second World War, which probably aren't many of us here, um, including me, I wasn't there then. Uh, <laughs> I may look like it, but I wasn't. Um, so a Marshall-style plan to, to build, to rebuild our energy infrastructure to be low carbon. So we need to build that infrastructure, the power stations, the the nuclear, the coal, uh, not the, the nu nuclear, the CCS, <laughs> the, uh, the renewables, the wind, the geothermals, all of these things. We need to be building these at a phenomenally fast rate and thinking about how we link them together as a system that links to how we use energy ourselves. So we've never been able to do this before in the past, but we need to be doing that now. And I think if you put those two together, we have an outside chance of avoiding dangerous climate change. But that choice is up to us. It's not something that's just for the politicians, because effectively we are the politicians. We are their friends, their families. They are people like us, educated in the same universities, the same sorts of backgrounds, by and large. Ultimately, um, we have to escape the shackles of a 20th century mindset if we're going to solve the problems of a 21st century. The 20th century was dominated very successfully by reductionist thinking. The problems that we face in the 21st century are systemic. Some of them are reductionist as well, but many of them are systemic. And the tools of reductionism are not always helpful in trying to address systemic problems. So from a university perspective, it's really interesting because we need to think quite differently about how we silo off our forms of knowledge and, more importantly, I think, our forms of understanding. This will demand leadership, courage, innovative thinking, engaged teams, and very difficult choices, and some humility, I think, to go along with that as well. So I think if we could do these things, if we could think about the world differently, then we have some hope. I'm going to finish off here with a quote that I always use from uh, Robert Unger, and I, I, I just, it captures so many things that are problematic about how we all view the world, not just about climate change, but elsewhere as well. At every level, the greatest obstacle to transforming the world is that we lack the clarity and imagination to conceive that it could be different. The clarity and imagination. Now, that's exactly our job in universities, but more widely it's our job as well, to think of, to have imagination, to have some clarity of thought and provide some some substance to what those thoughts could, what those um, imaginations could look like in terms of going forward, to think of a more prosperous, um, low-carbon, sustainable future. So on that note, I'll, I think that's the final slide, I'll finish. And as I say, um, I have a website with slides like this and other talks and other information um, related to some of the things I'm talking about today. So thank you very much.